Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Over time, words sort of change their meaning. Uh, we're celebrating today Good Shepherd Sunday. That word good can mean a, a lot of things. If you're, you're eating at somebody's house and the, the food that they're making is maybe a little bit below par, and they say, how is it? You don't say a little bit below par. You say good. So good kind of means maybe a little bit below par. If, if a child has had a rough day at school and he gets into the backseat of the car and, and mom or dad says, how was your day? And they say good. Good can also mean not that great of a day. Uh, that, that, word, that word good can, can mean a lot of things. And so often we think of, of something being good. Good is kind of a synonym of okay these days, isn't it? I'm doing, I'm doing good. But we see when we're talking about the good shepherd, we're not talking about an okay shepherd. We're not talking about a shepherd that's, that's okay sometimes and other times not. A shepherd that, that will, will pass for a shepherd. We're talking about good in the truest sense of the word. Our, our good shepherd is, is so profoundly good that, that he's the kind of shepherd who is willing to lay down his life for his sheep. So today we, we rejoice in, in a shepherd who truly is good. We continue on our service folder. First page here. We begin in the name, we begin our worship in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We worship our triune God for the salvation he gives us. Amen. We continue with our next hymn, hymn 360. Continue with the confession of sins. Dear friends, let us humbly and honestly approach God to confess our sins, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Gracious Lord, I confess that I am naturally born to be dead in my sin, 
I am altogether helpless for reaching eternal life in heaven. I am guilty of faithless worry and selfish pride for pet sins that I do over and over and so many other sins I don't even realize I do. Because of the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should drive me away from your presence forever by sending me to hell. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins, and I plead for your mercy. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Let us give all thanks and praise to our triune God. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ through faith. Even when we were dead in our sins, hear and trust the promise of forgiveness, which is ours through faith, as Jesus said to the paralyzed man and his friends in Luke chapter 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. We are thankful for the trust in God's merciful promise. Dear Lord, please strengthen and guide us so that we live our lives to your glory. Amen. In the security of his promises, let us pray to the Lord. For the well-being of all people everywhere, that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life, Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you. Hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For patience and perseverance through the trials of this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord of life, live in us that we may live for you. Dear Lord, strengthen our faith so that we do this. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the good shepherd and you laid down your life for the sins of all people. Lead us to the still waters of your life-giving word and lead us to lead others to that same water so that one day we may live eternally in your Father's house. For you live and reign with him and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Sometimes it happens that Christians recognize that they need more manpower to do the work of sharing the gospel in their midst, and so they get ready to call someone else to do that work, and maybe some interesting or silly questions and comments come up at that time. You hear people say things like, we need a young guy here to do the ministry in our midst. Not too young, 
who's kind of young, or we need someone here who has some children so that they can fill up our school, or we need someone here who has some children so that they can attract other younger families with children, or we need someone who has a wife who plays the organ, or we need a single guy so he's not as expensive as someone who has a wife or someone who has children. We need a real go-getter to do the ministry in our midst. We need someone who is going to set the vision for our congregation so that we might follow. Or we need someone who is going to follow my vision for the congregation so that we can grow the church. Uh, You hear some things like this sometimes. It's interesting as we go back and look at the book of Acts as we've been doing in this Easter season and looking at the early Christian church and the things that they did, I think that the dedication of the Christians really jumps out at you, doesn't it? They didn't talk about the price of insurance or just the, they weren't real concerned with those. It says that no one claimed any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. Imagine that. And the people who were involved in the ministry of the word, the apostles, they, when they got despised or beaten or thrown in jail, they were, they were happy about it. It says that they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to have the opportunity to suffer in the name of Jesus. And they kept preaching and teaching and proclaiming the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ to everybody right in the midst of the terrible treatment. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Here at the early Christian church in our lesson today, they, the numbers had been growing, the word of the Lord had been spreading, and as the word of the Lord spread, more and more disciples came to the faith and believed in Jesus as their Savior, and the ministry kept growing And one of those side or support ministries started to take the time from the apostles and take them away from the word of God. And so they recognized they needed more manpower. And they put together the qualifications of someone who would serve and and do the work. And it's interesting, the qualifications were quite short. They were looking for someone who was full of the spirit and wisdom. So that's what they look for. Not all these other qualifications, not the real go-getter or anything like this. They weren't all those earthly terms or whatever. Someone, but someone full of the spirit and wisdom. And the Lord of the church supplied these things to his church and they were happy and they rejoiced and the apostles, they they then they dedicated themselves to the ministry of the word and to prayer. Those are the things that they dedicated themselves to, not all the other things that could pull at their time, but they recognized that they needed to dedicate themselves to the ministry of the word and to prayer. And when these things happened, more and more people got to hear the word of the Lord proclaiming the Savior, Jesus Christ, and the church grew. More and more people believed and confessed that Jesus was their Savior. So one of these people who were full of the Spirit and wisdom and were selected to serve in the church was a guy by the name of Stephen. And Stephen, his job was to oversee the, the, food given to the, the food given to people. And he also, though, he was also a witness of his risen Christ. And so he also served the word to people and witnessed that word. The ministry of the word. This is the thing. This is the tool that God gives. His word always works. He said in the Old Testament in Isaiah, As the rain and the snow fall from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields bread for the eater and seed for the sower, 
He said, so is my word that comes from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish the purpose for which I sent it. So as you see things in the earth bud and flourish today, think of God's word. It does two things. It brings to life. It creates faith. It strengthens faith. That's what it did in the early Christian church. The book of Acts there on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people came to faith. And the number of disciples grew. Or it does the opposite thing. It, it kills. It convicts. It hardens. And that's what we see here in the ministry today of Stephen. He gave himself to the ministry of the word. And when he pointed out the word and when he showed the people their sin... Their reaction, they weren't cut to the heart and they didn't say, oh, what shall we do? They said, we're told that they were, they were furious with Stephen. And they gnashed their teeth at him. I don't even know exactly what that is. So then Stephen, as a servant of the word, he also shared Jesus with them. And what did they do? Did they say, oh, he's such a nice guy? Oh, they were so furious that they covered their ears, we're told, and they yelled at the top of their voices. And they rushed at Stephen, and they dragged him out of town, and they threw stones at him until he was dead. Anyway, at the end of his life, Stephen then gave himself over to prayer, and he dedicated himself to prayer, and he prayed prayers which echoed Jesus' prayer. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, and Father, forgive them. Stephen, he had a short ministry, but he was a good shepherd, wasn't he? Dedicated to the ministry of the word, dedicated to prayer for the people. What motivated Stephen's ministry was Jesus. He saw Jesus, he knew Jesus rose from the dead, and he knew that Jesus was sitting at the right hand of the Father, watching over him, watching over his church, and he drew great comfort that Jesus was with him, just as promised, surely I am with you always to the very end of the earth. May God grant us good shepherds to watch over us those who give themselves and are dedicated to the ministry of the word and to prayer. This is the tool that our God gives. This is how he convinces. This is how he convicts. This is how he comforts because where the word is, there is God's spirit creating faith in our Savior, the good shepherd who gave his life for his sheep, the good shepherd who rose to give us life now and forever. Our lesson today from Acts chapter 6 and chapter 7. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. 
Opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. To this he replied, brothers and fathers, listen to me. You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this They covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. This is the word of our Lord. We sing Psalm 23. Rodney Ricks from Trinity Lutheran in Hoskins. We just sang about following our good shepherd. When is it easy to follow the good shepherd? 
green pastures, quiet waters, nothing I need, nothing I want for. Easy to follow the Good Shepherd then, isn't it? You could even say it's easy to follow the Good Shepherd through the valley of the shadow of death. Don't we live there, really? I mean, we're all mortal. We know that. There's X number of sunrises and sunsets that we get to see. We have no idea when it's going to end. We know that there one day will be an end. Seems like sometimes there's no rhyme or reason. Someone, we look at them and we say, ah, oh, they're going to be alive decades from now. And suddenly they're gone. And another person, we go, oh, they won't be here by the end of today. And they go on, and they go on. And it doesn't make sense to us. And we're okay with that, right? That's the way it is with us being mortal. And it's easy to follow the shepherd even then. In fact, sometimes when we're the one sitting in the doctor's office, and the doctor is saying to us, there's nothing I can do. That leads us to follow him even more closely. Because the control has just been taken away from us. I know I can't fix this. I know I can't do this. I need that shepherd. And we have the comfort of sitting at a banquet surrounded by enemies in the valley of the shadow of death and we go but the good shepherd's got me and we're at peace with that and it's easy to follow the good shepherd but what if the reason for your anxiety the reason for your worry the danger that surrounds you what if it is really following the Good Shepherd that causes that? Now can you still so eagerly follow the Good If you could get rid of the problems by just no longer following, would you still so eagerly follow? Remember who's being led by the Holy Spirit to write these words. It's the Apostle Peter, right? He was the main messenger on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people were baptized. Amazing, right? So I was talking about Peter and how Peter was the one who spoke on Pentecost Sunday and 3,000 people were baptized. He was the one that was with John when the man who was crippled was raised or was given the ability to walk. And because of that, the Sanhedrin brought... Peter in and they brought him in the night before meaning here spending the night in jail and Peter spent a night in jail and then appeared before the Sanhedrin which is the Jewish ruling council the same Jewish ruling council that had handed Jesus over to Pontius Pilate to be ordered to be crucified and he had stood before of them and they had said you guys are not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus and Peter had boldly stood in front of them and said, you know something? You guys will have to judge whether it's right for us to obey you or rather than God. He said, but as for us, we can't help but speak about what we've seen and heard. Another time they were arrested, this time all the apostles. And God sends an angel and he brings them out of prison and tells them, go into the temple courts right away in the morning and speak in the name of Jesus. And that's exactly what they did. Peter would have also been there when Stephen was chosen, right? He would have also been part of the group that would have said, Stephen, here's what we want you to do. He would have seen Stephen's work. He also would have known firsthand what was done to Stephen. How Stephen died. This is now being written at the end of Peter's life. How long was that list of people who had faithfully followed the Good Shepherd and were no longer there because they had given their life for the good shepherd because of the good shepherd. And yet, what's Peter doing? He's saying, keep following the good shepherd. Same Peter that also knows the other side of this coin, right? The same Peter who had in the courtyard of the high priest while Jesus is on trial 
denied in front of a servant girl and a bunch of the guards, swore in the name of God. He never knew Jesus. He knew that pain as well. So why is Peter encouraging so much that we would remain faithful and continue to following the Lord? He never once refers to his shame and his guilt, does he? He doesn't say, I want you to keep following Jesus because I don't want you to be ashamed. I don't want you to have to go through what I went through. No, he points directly to the shepherd, doesn't he? He says, follow the good shepherd because his father is God who judges everyone justly. Because of the Heavenly Father who sees everything you go through and knows everything that happens to you, you keep following the Good Shepherd because in the end you'll have your victory in the Lord just as Stephen did. But then he also goes back and he says, you know something, follow the Good Shepherd because through that Good Shepherd is where all your wounds are healed. Through that Good Shepherd you are given life and given the ability to live for God. You may realize what an amazing thing that is. I mean, we realize how selfish we are, how much we like to have things our way, even when we know that's not what God wants us to do. We still like getting our own way, even when it's sinful. Our sinful nature loves to have its own way. And now, he says, that good shepherd gives you the ability through his wounds because he willingly allowed himself to be mistreated. He has given you the ability to live for him and for righteousness. His wounds heal us. So he says, don't give up. He says, no matter what, don't sacrifice following that good shepherd because through him you are healed. What a wonderful thing, right? Think of all the people with COVID, all the families who mourn losses, and you, and you go, healing, healing. What, what a powerful word for our nation today. Healing for sin, healing for death, life eternal. That's what's ours in our Good Shepherd. Life eternal. Even for a man like Stephen, seemingly lost in earthly battle, yet he lives through Jesus. We too lose our earthly battles, but we live through Jesus. And so Peter encourages us today. He says, no matter what you go through, even when it's difficult, don't give up following your good shepherd. First Peter 2, verses 19 through 25, God says to us, for it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not re retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were, all, were, for you were like sheep going astray. But now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So far, a reading of God's word. We continue with hymn, under, hymn number 453, Come Follow Me, the Savior Spoke.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you all from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Paul Hirsch. I get to serve the saints here at St. Paul's Norfolk, as well as the saints out in beautiful Savior O'Neill, O'Neill, Nebraska. My sense of hearing is hugely important as I go through my day. How many things don't we hear that we don't even realize we hear that are so important? It goes, something I hear goes in one ear and out the other, and I'm not talking about that spouse thing at all, not at all. But how many noises don't we hear during the day you don't even really notice? Think about this morning. Most likely, I heard the first thing I heard this morning when my alarm went off that I hear a sound like that, I recognize it, and say, oh, that's an alarm, it's telling me something. But then I also have a follow-up to that. I hear it, I recognize it, then I react. I get up, I get the day started. It's a pretty important thing for my sense of hearing to do that. How about going into the kitchen? Something I hear in the morning that really goes in one ear, maybe goes out the other, is hearing the coffee pot going, oh, I hear it dripping through there, I recognize it, oh, that's my morning drink. And how do I react? I react in a positive way. I enjoy my cup of coffee. How about the birds that I hear singing outside, those wonderful morning birds, right? You even notice them, but say, oh, I hear them, I recognize that wonderful good noise, and I react Maybe have an extra bounce in my step, what have you. That day goes along. You go out in the garage, get in your car. What do you expect to hear? You turn the key. I expect to hear that car start. I expect to hear that motor run. But on the way to church, on the way to work, on the way to wherever you're going, you hear a thump, clunk, thump, clunk. You go, oh, I hear. I recognize this is not normal. Something is wrong. I got to do something. How do I react? Some people might react to that thump clunk and just keep on going. Say, ah, I got to get there. It's not that bad. But probably the best thing to do when you hear that thump clunk is to react and stop. Pull over. If you're on the highway, pull over. Right? There are all kinds of different reactions we have in an instance like that that can have some pretty important consequences, probably financial consequences. The parable that we hear for our gospel lesson today, coming from John chapter 10, John chapter 10, often called the Good Shepherd chapter. Jesus is teaching truths in illustration, using illustrations to teach truths to directly to the Pharisees. If you look in John chapter 9, Jesus is being confronted by the Pharisees, his his religious enemies. That in John chapter 9, Jesus has just healed a man born with blindness, and now he's being attacked, Jesus is being attacked because the Pharisees said, you healed on the Sabbath day, you work, now you're in trouble. The Pharisees were attacking him. Jesus didn't back down. Jesus used this as a teaching opportunity, and so this beginning of John chapter 10 directly addresses those Pharisees who are attacking him. And he uses a very familiar picture in his teaching lesson in using two parables with this this front section of John chapter 10, a sheep and a shepherd. Now us, living here in beef country, at least I'll speak for myself, I don't really know sheep at all. I don't know cattle much more than I know sheep. But realize or not, there's a big difference between how a cowboy tends his cattle compared to a shepherd tending his sheep. Do you ever notice in all those movies, those those romantic western movies of the cattle drives and this and that, what does the cowboy do? He's got his rope out, he's on his horse, he's whistling, he's yipping, he's whatever. What is he doing? He's on a cattle drive. He is driving those cattle to wherever they're going. He's basically behind the cattle. That's what a prod is, right? You drive the beef steer, whereas sheep, very different, follow. Here's the voice of the good shepherd to hear, 
to recognize and react, right? Sheep are very different. You don't drive sheep, at least from what I've, I'm told, I hear, I understand. Sheep follow you. All kinds of voices out there that you and I have the opportunity to listen to, to hear, and to recognize and react to. And when you think of this connection that Jesus is making with the Pharisees, he's obviously talking about in a religious sense. All kinds of... Of voices, And I suppose you could really narrow down voices into three sections. Voices that talk about truth. I think about this, this definition of truth today and, and say, boy, truth is, is relative, right? Think of COVID thing. There could be truth coming from expert A over there talking about COVID. And then there's expert B over here talking about COVID and their truths don't really match, and you say, well, which truth do I follow? Truth is relative. But when you're talking about truth, truth found in Scripture, truth of human reality, the truth is we're all going to die. So how is it that a person, any person, reacts to that truth? And that's where I say there could be three different options to react to that, that somebody might have to convince him or herself very, very hard. It's a very, very hard thing to do, to convince myself that there's nothing after I die. When I die, I just become a pile of dirt and there's nothing. Nothing happens. Or you can look at the truth that the Bible, so many religions talk about. Yeah, there is a good place to go to and there's a bad place to go to. There's a heaven and there's a hell. Now, this is what Jesus is talking about, the truth, the voices that speak about those two truths. How is it that you reach that good place called heaven? How is it that a person reaches that bad place called hell? And Jesus refers, he's talking to those Pharisees, talking about the importance of the voice, the voices that talk about that. I just think of the four guys who wear these gown things around once in a while in front of church and say, what a good reminder for us. The importance of the voices that we share. What is it that comes out of our mouths, our voices? What is it that we speak about? The truths of God's holy word, nothing more, nothing less. How incredibly important that is. But then also the voices that are shared, voices that are shared by teachers, schools that aren't having school, voices that are shared by parents, the encouragement that all of us as Christians have to share the voices shared in God's holy word, the voices that talk about sin, the voices that talk about how those sins are forgiven. And this is what Jesus is talking about, John chapter 9, that Jesus talks about this aspect of the entryway to, to the gate, Psalm 23, the, the quiet pastures, the, the, the green pastures, the quiet waters, uh, the grace of forgiveness, ultimately the, the destination of heaven. And Jesus in, in John chapter 10 talks about, I am the gate, chapter or verse 9. He says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. To say, what voice do I follow? That some people just ignore the reality of life after death, but then to say, how is it that I get to heaven? Those other two options? How do I get there? There's a voice that Jesus refers to that only comes from Satan. The voice that says, I am centrally important for that salvation. It's what I do. It's what I don't do. It's how nice I am. It's how much I give to church. It's what I do. Compared to the voice of Jesus Christ, who says, come follow me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And still fresh on our minds is all, are all, these, all this information we have and the reminders from Easter, right? Good Friday, how that shepherd laid down his life for the sheep. Easter Sunday, how that good shepherd rose from the dead for the sake of of the sheep. 
And with all these different voices out there in the religious world, I think that's what most people think about when it talks about different voices, all kinds of options that we have. There's this kind of church body, there's that kind of religious group, all kinds of different voices out there. But really, it really boils down to two voices, right? Maybe three, if you say to that voice who's ignoring life after death, but two voices, religiously speaking. Either you rely on Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, to get to heaven, or you don't. Either you rely on Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, or you rely on yourself, myself, in order to get to heaven, how good I am. And so what a comfort it is, comfort it is for us to see the good shepherd, to hear the good shepherd, and to hear the promise that he gives. The last verse of our, our text he says the thief that's satan the thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy i have come that they may have life and have it to the full and has already been referred to this morning have life to the full this isn't a kind of nice life that once in a while there's some nice things and most of the time there's not so nice things it's not a wishful thinking kind of a full life that I hope, I wish, I really like to have a full life after I die to go to heaven and have life to the full. Here's this picture. The good shepherd, our cups running over with God's grace and forgiveness. Boy, it's all ours. All ours through what our Savior God, our triune God has accomplished for us and have life to the full, eternal life in heaven in spite of our sins. And this reminds me, I like to use a Romans, or a Revelation chapter 7 when I conduct a funeral service talking about what is it that we are celebrating? What is it that we as Christians look forward to? So many pictures of Jesus, good shepherd, sheep following the good shepherd. Revelation chapter 7 really sums it all very, very well. For the Lamb... At the center of the throne, Jesus will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So, hearing, recognizing, and reacting. Very important, maybe when it comes to the car, some clunk or thunk, whatever happens in that car, very important to hear, recognize something's wrong, React accordingly, okay, but that pales in comparison to the sheep that we are, to hear, to hear our good shepherd inviting us to follow him, to recognize that voice, recognize the voice of the thief, Satan, somebody is telling us something that's not in scripture, don't listen, don't follow, but to react, to react to the voices we hear, either it follows that voice of the good shepherd or it doesn't. And we follow that voice, the voice of Jesus Christ to our eternal home in heaven. Would you listen, pay attention to our gospel lesson for this morning? John chapter 10. Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That's the end of our gospel lesson. Let's sing our next hymn. The King of Love, My Shepherd Is.
We continue by confessing our common faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with the prayer of the church. In addition to the prayer of the church, we'll be having a special prayer uh, for Jen Winters, sister-in-law, who lives in Minneapolis. Uh, she's a member here at St. Paul's. Uh, so we'll include a special prayer for her after the prayer of the church. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, our risen Savior, truly you are our good shepherd. For you gave your life for us, your sheep. Surely it was your great love for us sinners who were lost and strained that moved you to come into this world to live, to die, and to rise again, that we might have life that does not end. Good Shepherd, we owe you heartfelt thanks and praise and our continual love and devotion for all that you have done and still do to ensure our earthly and eternal welfare. Nevertheless, we must confess that we still have a rebellious old Adam that is stubborn and sinful and continually leads us astray. Therefore, we need your loving patience as our good shepherd to deliver us from our sinful ways, to protect us from our own foolishness, and to forgive our many sins. Our shepherd, by your continual presence, comfort and cheer us in every journey we must make through the dark, shadowy valley of this life. Satisfy us with the green pastures of your word, and there nourish our faith. Quench our thirst for righteousness with the refreshing streams of salvation. When we are oppressed on every hand by troubles, distress, temptations, sickness, and heartache, teach us to turn our eyes of faith to you, the Good Shepherd, and to cast all of our cares upon you. Answer our anxious cries, for only you know what is best for us. Refresh us with your help and guidance, your protection and healing. Hear us, merciful Savior and Shepherd. Dear gracious God, Lord of life and death, in your wisdom you have taken Jeanette Rasmussen, sister-in-law of Jan Winter, out of this sinful and painful earthly life. We thank you for the gracious gift of your gospel, which reminds us all of the blessed truth of the forgiveness of all of our sins. We thank you for the opportunities that Jeanette had to, in, in her time of grace to hear about her sins and how Jesus forgave those sins through his holy life and sacrifice, death and glorious resurrection. Be with all of Jeanette's family and friends, especially Jan, and as they adjust their earthly loss to their earthly loss, always remind them of the heavenly glory that is Jeanette's through the gift of faith. Through Jesus, in, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We continue with our final hymn, hymn number 432, I Am Jesus' Little Lamb.
Good morning again, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, again, Paul Hirsch. My name is Paul Hirsch. I get to serve here at St. Paul's. First thing I'd like to do before I forget is to read a, an important letter from Mrs. Katie Brown. She writes, Dear members of St. Paul's Lutheran Church, this letter is to acknowledge that you have extended the call for me to serve as the kindergarten teacher at St. Paul's. I've enjoyed teaching preschool this year and am truly humbled that you are giving me the opportunity to consider whether this would be a good way for me to continue serving our ministries here in Norfolk. Please keep me in your prayers as I deliberate the call you have given me, that God would guide my decision according to his will. In Christ, Katie Brown. And if you go online to follow along with this bullet in the service folder, there's, there's some more information in there, stuff happening here at St. Paul's, one of which um, is the, the, the call situation. Uh, Mr. Dan Douglas returning a call and uh, the Paulsons moving uh, to Salt Lake City uh, and, and making preparations, making plans uh, for how school is going to be happening next year. A lot of things, a lot of meetings, a lot of discussions have happened this last week and hopefully it's, it's um, summarized clearly on, on the, in the service folder and this will be emailed out to you as well. Uh, just to hopefully keep you as, as informed as much as possible. Uh, one other important part of information right now, oh, oh, very important, is to thank Karen. Karen Poofwell, thanks for tickling the ivories this morning. Wonderful, wonderful to have you do that. Um, something that, that affects all of us standing up here is this, this virus thing. Uh, and long story short, Pastor Zicky, and I'm looking at you, You're, you and I are... <laughs> No. Pastor Zicky and Rick's uh, Hader and Hoskins churches uh, are going to be going back to, to normal, and I'll let them talk about that. But concerning St. Paul's here and, and St. John Stanton, there's at least one more Sunday that we're going to be going through this uh, online video thing, and, and uh, we'll just have to get information out to you as best as soon as we can about what, what's going to be happening as far as St. Paul's. So... Um, uh, Sunday, Sunday, May 10th, uh, there still will be this online opportunity for St. Paul's folks uh, to do this. We will not be gathering here at church or inviting people to gather here at church until after, after May 10th. Is that clear enough, Gary? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I'll leave it at that. I just... Is it on now? No. All right. Thank you. Jason Schultz, I'm privileged to serve St. John Stanton and Shepherd of Peace Norfolk. And uh, just a couple announcements. Viola Wagner, she was assigned from our teacher training college about 64 years ago, I think, if my math is correct. And she taught at St. John Stanton and then got married, and she stayed here at the Lord Called Her Home a week ago on her 86th birthday and so she is now in the arms of her good shepherd so we rejoice with her family and we also pray that the good shepherd um, the comfort her friends and family her funeral was a small private funeral at the funeral home with a size limit of 10 on Friday so then also greetings to the Encouragement for the congregation. Somehow we have to get together and figure this out when to get together again. Balancing how many people we have in our church and then asking those who are in the higher risk categories not to come. So, And then we need Shepherd of Peace congregation to be on the same page as St. John's in Stanton. So the elders might need to get together and we should schedule a meeting, you guys. But till that time... We'll meet here next Sunday. Thank you. So as uh, Paul mentioned, we'll be getting back together for worship. Coming uh, up next week, we'll have our normal Sunday 9 a.m. service. And the Monday night at 7.30, we'll, we'll have that over at the school just to keep them uh, the two services in different places. Uh, a couple of notes for that. We're going to be following all the, the proper protocol, the, the social distancing. We'll have... Um, 
the, the offering and things like that will be different. The service will look different, but it'll be a, a wonderful thing to be back together in, in God's house uh, worshiping. Uh, a couple of things to, to say about that, uh, though, is uh, if, if, you, if there is any sort of hesitation because of legitimate health reasons or things like that that you would like to not attend, that is 100% okay for right now. Just let me know. Uh, call me, email me, text me, and I can minister to you over the phone like I've been doing for some of our shut-ins or, or, or however uh, you feel comfortable. Uh, but again, we will um, be getting together for worship on, on the, the 10th and 11th. Uh, and also, kind of a, a reminder, not, not a fun reminder to make, and, and again, it's the, the part of the, the COVID-19 telling people not to come to your church, but, but uh, I would encourage you that... that Pastor Ricks and, and I are going to be having church. I would encourage you, though, to, to stick with your congregation. If you're a member of the Shepherd of Peace or, or whatever it may be, um, continue to, to tune into this broadcast uh, and have patience for just a couple of weeks, and everything will, will be a little bit more normal probably uh, in the next couple of weeks. If you've been listening to this and you aren't a Wells member and don't have a church, then please do come to my church. Um, <laughs> hey, hater Nebraska. Uh, I'm... Emmanuel Lutheran. So again, <laughs> again, uh, if you don't have a church and you live in, in live in Pierce County and you're tuning in right now, my church is open and ready to, to minister. Um, so, but again, stick with your church if you have one. God bless your week, and I'll, I'll see my members and a lot of other people next week. Pastor Ricks. Um, Look forward to seeing the members of Trinity at worship on next Sunday, Mother's Day, 10 a.m. We'll have worship services. You'll get um, information in the mail and through email this week um, in regards to kind of how that's going to look like and also encouragements to be wise. And if you're not comfortable um, coming, then by all means don't feel that you should be putting yourself at risk when you're not comfortable with that. Just as far as this goes, this is probably the last Sunday that we will do this worship service with all four of us here and I just want to say thank you to the men and to the churches especially to the members of St. Paul's for letting us be a part of this and to their leadership for allowing us to participate with this and Pastor Hirsch especially for um, being so gracious in hosting us here. Um, it's been a blessing for me personally and for these guys to have this little way to still minister to our people as opposed to just saying, hey, I'm not going to do anything, just tune into the radio. And, he, and, and this has been much nicer, to be able to be here and have a part of the worship service. What a blessing it has been. Thanks so much to all of those people who are responsible for that. Lord's blessings to all of you today. And, and let's not forget, I should not forget to, to thank the button pushers. Mr. Brown is button computer, or pushing computer buttons, and Daryl Dusso is, is TV, and Damon... Uh, Damon Weinrich, a uh, lot of people behind the scenes back there to, to make sure this goes. So um, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. And lady up there already got Karen. But thanks, guys. <laughs>